problems of our world are overwhelming. Urgency pushes us toward quick fixes and band-aid solutions. But the underlying issues remain unsolved. And the problems reoccur again and again. At World Relief, we want to see an end to this cycle. We believe God has a plan to save our broken world. And it begins with His church and His people. His plan involves the transformation of the whole person, physically, mentally, socially, and spiritually. And it paves the way for transformed communities and nations. For over 75 years, across 100 countries, World Relief has joined God in His plan to transform our world, building upon the resources of local churches to address the root causes of suffering and meet their community's unique needs. And with the help of people like you, we're tackling our world's greatest problems and helping communities create lasting change from within. In communities suffering from extreme poverty, we equip local pastors to train community members with lessons in savings, agriculture, health and nutrition, and child development, allowing hope to take root and the chains of poverty to be broken. In the wake of natural disasters, we deliver emergency relief and build resiliency so we can save lives before, during, and after disaster strikes. When refugees, immigrants, and displaced people flee persecution, poverty, or violence, we provide immediate assistance and help them restart their lives by building welcoming communities here in the U.S. We educate churches and communities on issues of immigration and asylum and advocate for fair policies for our vulnerable neighbors. And in communities plagued by violence and oppression across the globe, we empower local churches to lead the way in bringing peace, healing, and restoration for all people. We are a movement of over 6,000 churches, 95,000 volunteers, and millions of individuals in the U.S. and around the globe, living out God's plan to bring hope, compassion, and transformation to our world. Together, we're creating change that lasts today, tomorrow, and for generations to come. Will you join us? Hi, I'm Charles Galda, President of Vision New England, and your host for the Church in Action program, where we talk with New England leaders about the imperative to make disciples, do justice, foster union, share Jesus to transform New England. This week, I'm talking with Patty McDonald from World Relief, and that clip you just heard uh, is an overview of what World Relief does around the world. Uh, Patty's the Northeast Director of Strategic Partnerships at World Relief. She lives right here in New England, uh, but World Relief, as you heard, is a global ministry uh, working here in the U.S., but around the world, including places like Ukraine and Afghanistan, and we'll touch on those as we go today. Patty, thanks so much for being with us. It's great to be here. Patty, now, I was going to say, hey, for folks who don't know World Relief, can you give us a quick overview? But I think we just did that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, but let me come in a slightly different way, though. The um, you know We've been doing this project that we call the Post-Pandemic Church Project, where um, we really focused in on a, broad, a biblical definition of justice, that's fairly broad uh, about all of the things that are wrong in the world, really. And we live in a target rich environment. And so how do you think about the work World Relief does uh, and how does that intersect with doing justice from your perspective? Yeah, uh, well, just to start off with a clear and clean like mission statement for World Relief would be to empower the church, the church to serve the most vulnerable for lasting change. And that is a justice issue, of course. Um, it really, it really speaks to, um, yeah. How, how if Jesus was here, the thing that Jesus cared about most was the least of these. Mm -hmm. So, how does that really flesh out as Christ followers? Um, I, I take it as um, very much a Micah, you know, six eight to act justly, uh, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. And I think um, giving a voice, giving a voice of those um, in, in desperate need, whether that is 
that refugee, that person fleeing their home at no notice, uh, whether that's the extreme poor, whether that's women and children who 85% of all the work that we do really uh, focuses on helping to benefit uh, women and children. And, you know, in times of disaster, in times of conflict, you know, we, we know that the extreme poor and the most vulnerable suffer that much more. And so even, you know, in this last year, uh, which is, you know, COVID introduced tremendous vulnerability. It, it basically, basically set back 10 years, the millennial goals that were set for people living in extreme poverty. But um, you add COVID and then the last 10 months uh, with the Haiti earthquake and then the fall of the Taliban taking over Kabul and Afghanistan. And then you have Ukraine and the major conflict. You, uh, you see just how vulnerable women and children and the poor have uh, really suffered now, maybe could just why is it? So I understand in war zones you'd serve more women and children, right? Because men are going to be doing the fighting in a lot of cases. Uh, or, 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 but why is it in almost every disaster is it more women and children uh, who end up needing world relief or being sort of touched by world relief? Well, um, you know, so so we work in these different areas, focus areas. OK, so let, let's start with uh, mass displacement. OK, so um, often, you know, people fleeing. So before um, before Ukraine, there were probably about 81 million displaced people in the world. Um, now, with just uh, the, the mass displacement, the displacement in, internally in Ukraine, we, we're, we're over the 90 million mark, okay? Um, and you saw directly how that influenced women and children because the men were stayed back to fight. But um, I think, in, you know, may, maybe in some ways we take granted the protections in our country that um, for, for women and children, but um, internationally, um, you know, in, in a lot of the areas, uh, like I said, we work in extreme, uh, we work with mass displacement. That's one bucket with refugees, people seeking asylum, um, et cetera. But then the other is um, major bucket that we work um, in is with the extreme poor. And we're talking, Charles, uh, people that live on less than $2 a day, $2 a day people in the hardest to reach places uh, that, that lack just the essentials, you know, clean water and, and just basic needs, education, health. And um, in this area, specifically World Relief um, comes alongside the local church to uh, make the local church the hero by training and equipping pastors and, and volunteers and in these areas of extreme poverty, often, you know, the, these women are women and children are very vulnerable because you you've got belief systems of of uh, let's say men having several wives, you know, in in that culture, and that's accepted, or women who are not able to have any kind of credit, and so um, you know women and children that live in areas of violence and oppression. I mean, I, that's another major area we work in, but, you know, I visited the Congo, you know, the, the Congo, DRC Congo is the rape capital of the world. 60% um, of all women in the Congo have been assaulted and uh, not only once, but multiple times. And when they're assaulted and they go, they try to go back to the community they get rejected and excommunicated. So what do these what do these women do? Where do they go? And so World Relief is is very unique in um, coming alongside uh, women who um, have experienced this level of violence and oppression, um, and let's say with sexual gender based violence, uh, like I discussed. Um, World Relief trains and equips the local church and the local community so that when a woman does try to integrate back with her family, 
if her family rejects her, if her husband rejects her, then that support group will help with the trauma and help um, bring like income generating skills to that woman so that woman can survive. Mm -hmm. I mean, we are really talking about like very um, desperate situations where we believe that the, the local church is why we work through the local church. It's why we work with the infrastructure of the local church because we believe that the local church is, is God's answer to come alongside the most vulnerable. Culturally, some of the examples you're using sound to me very much like what we expect in biblical times of, you know, a woman without a husband, father, right, is very much at risk and exposed and, it, yeah. and can be rejected by her family, right, even if it's not something she's done, but it's been done to her. But right? yeah. it sounds like a lot of the same dynamics. Is that a fair assessment? Absolutely. You know, uh, it's, it's hard for us to even imagine. But yes, you know, it goes on. I mean, we know. You know, with uh, with Afghanistan, you know, we know uh, just how vulnerable these these women are now that the Taliban has taken over, and um, and we've experienced it. You know, the last year in in helping to resettle thousands of Afghans uh, to, to the United States through the U.S. government. Let me let me just step back a little because we I've kind of touched a little bit about what we do internationally, but World Relief. Um, has um, 17 U local offices in the U.S. And, and it's those offices that we um, help to resettle uh, refugees and come alongside um, with immigration, um, legal services, and helping with uh, just essential vital needs and services. Um, and so we have these offices scattered around the United States. <laughs> And really interesting fact, um, 40 plus years ago uh, in, with uh, uh, the conflict in Vietnam, a missionary, a missionary couple, they were um, from the Christian Missionary Alliance. They were the ones that reached out to World Relief and said, we have got to do something about these, these refugees, um, helping refugees come over um, to the United States. And so that's really when World Relief um, stepped up and became um, became an adversary for, not an adversary, an advocate, <laughs> sorry, an advocate for refugees and um, to this day. And so, and we do it in a very unique way. Um, we keep that model about having the local church be the the hero and coming alongside vulnerable people. But the U.S. government has nine, um, nine agencies that they work with, um, and uh, World Relief is one of them. And we've been working with the U.S. government for 40 plus years, and, um, and we were chosen by them. And, and some of these organizations are faith-based organizations, um, but World Relief's kind of uh, model is not just to come alongside a refugee for 90 days, mm -hmm. but really almost 18 months. We, we, we help to welcome refugees. We um, help to get them set up, but then we use the local church and volunteers to come alongside any needs that they might have to like help to integrate them into this, this new culture. And a lot of times these refugee, refugees come over and it, it wasn't their choice. They've just been thrown into this situation. And we saw that, you know, recently with Af Afghanistan. And Patty, you know, it's very, it's hard to read the Bible and miss that we're called to take care of aliens, immigrants, uh, foreigners. But what would you say to the person who's an honest, honestly engaging in this conversation who would say, um, but I, but I don't know that I'm not helping a terrorist come here. Uh, or right, what does World Relief do something with that, or does the government? How do how do you know that who you're bringing here is safe? Yeah, well, you know, definitely, um, you know, the majority of the refugees who let, let's say just with Afghanistan, they were vetted. These Afghan refugees, they were vetted in other countries before they came over to the U.S. So, um, and that's very that's a very important. I think that's a very relevant. That's a very relevant. Um, question to ask, because I think that, you know, 
through one thing and another over several years, people are fearful. They, they're fearful. However, um, what World Belief does uniquely is that we have two people that work um, who are really on the front lines of advocacy and um, the, the dialogues about um, immigrants and refugees. Matt Sorens, who's written several books, uh, Welcoming the Stranger, and recently has uh, um, written another uh, new book that is just coming out in, in the next few weeks. And also Jenny Yang, who is our uh, Z senior VP of advocacy, who are, literally is you know, on the front lines in, um, you know, at the Capitol, basically bringing dialogues of fairness and conversation regarding, you know, um, statuses of refugees and, and what is just. Um, the unique thing about World Relief is we um, have resources in Matt and Jenny and our U.S. staff that will come alongside we don't take a political side. We don't see it as a political issue. We just see it as more of a, this is the biblical mandate of how do we welcome the stranger and how do we care for those who are her most vulnerable and who, who have been displaced. Mm -hmm. But it's, it is, you know, I, I really appreciate questions like that because I do think through one thing and another, people have become fearful, like, oh, you know, how do we know these people are safe? And that's um, that's a really good question. Although um, some, you know, Matt um, and Jenny have both shared in their books and in their, um, you know, speaking um, and being a voice out there, that actually the statistics show that you know, you know, there's a very very small percentage mm -hmm. of uh, immigrants and refugees who actually cause any kind of threat. Yeah. We hear about it um, in the news and in different, you know, news channels, but um, statistically, it's 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 really not accurate. Yeah, and and so tell us because you're working and you we've already mentioned two really I can't imagine they're easy places to work Afghanistan and Ukraine, and yeah. so how how do you even work in places like that? What does that look like? And is is it the same model in Afghan and Ukraine? Or are they completely different? So actually, we are not working in Ukraine, um, in Afghanistan. We're okay. not working. We were because for for whatever reason. Um, well, I'll tell you the reason. Where we have our offices located, World Relief out of those nine governmental agencies, ha we have um, resettled a disproportionate amount of Afghans. We have, you know, in our Seattle office, in our offices in California, huge communities of Afghans, also in Texas, some in Chicago. And so when, you know, it, everything came down with uh, the Taliban moving in and people fleeing at such a, um, a high rate, um, World Relief was literally the, the first responder. We were the ones at the military uh, bases welcoming and receiving because of our mm -hmm. expertise. Okay. And so um, we um, definitely, you know, have um, kind of that experience. We ha had that experience to to come alongside and, and be that welcoming agent and as the Afghans were coming over. And um, but we actually are not working inside Afghanistan. So I wanted to clear that up. Yeah, okay. uh, I, meant, I meant to Thank tell you, you that before. In Ukraine, different story. Um, in Ukraine, we are working with um, with partners uh, that, um, for instance, uh, one denomination that has 48,000 churches all over Ukraine, um, also some other ministries right inside of Ukraine distributing uh, food and water and temporary shelters. Um, so we... Um, and, uh, I think I mentioned this before, that since the conflict started, I just heard the statistic as of June 6th, that the, the funds that have been received uh, for Ukraine, World Relief has assisted over 40,000 people. Just in Ukraine. Just in Ukraine. Wow. And um, we're also working in those those neighboring countries, four of the neighboring countries receiving refugees too. And again, you know, part of 
part of uh, receiving those refugees is also creating safe spaces for women and children. We know that, um, you know, that they become targets of sex trafficking. So that's one issue. Uh, But we, again, providing shelter, providing um, food, water, and also transportation uh, for these refugees coming over. So it's been it's been very uh, significant. And for folks who oops, sorry, God. And I and unfortunately, um, yeah, we know, unfortunately, it's going to continue, but we just have to pray for the end of this conflict. You know, it's, uh, last number I saw was 10 million displaced people just in Ukraine since the war started. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I think there were over 4 million people who were displaced and it started crossing over the borders, but inside Ukraine, a good 8, 8 million plus. Mm-hmm. So altogether, we're talking 12. Yeah. like more like 12 yeah. million. So it's just, it's so heartbreaking. Um, it's so heartbreaking. And, you know, Biden made that announcement um, a couple of months ago. I, I remember it distinctly because I was invited uh, by some churches in Boston to speak at a Pray for Ukraine event uh, at a congregation in Brookline that was um, had a high concentration of Ukrainians. And uh, at that that day, um, so many of the women and like family members came up to me and said, you know, we've got to, um, you know, we've we've got to make room to have these Ukrainians come over to the United Mm -hmm. States and um, and, you know, just asking for prayer about that. And and I prayed with several people that day. Um, And then the very next day, Biden made that announcement that 100,000 um, Ukrainian refugees will be coming to the United States. Um, the details around that are a little different, though. Um, they'll be coming over in the next two years, about 100,000. Um, and, the, and the main effort really is family reunification. So, um, so reuniting families. So there's a lot of that going on. But I, as you know, I just came back from Europe, and really the um, the 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 talk and the verbiage I've been receiving has been that a, a lot of these Ukrainians who have been displaced, they're hovering in Europe, mm-hmm. but they want to go back. Yeah. So they really want to go back. The other issue, uh, Charles, that really um, this whole issue of displacement, it has been interesting, and I'm sure you've heard this, but the average displaced person spends about 17 years in an internally displaced camp, person camp. So we're talking children, about half of those are children, 50%. So it is... um, it is heartbreaking. The situation in itself is heartbreaking. And I 100% support and feel terrible about what's going on regarding um, Ukraine. But it does uh, strike a tender note in my heart to think of those children who have been waiting in line mm-hmm. for you know several years of those individuals, these families, on an average of 17 years. Mm-hmm who are waiting to come over and to, to start a new life. So it, it brings up a very sensitive subject. And, and you know, we we're talking about the security risks that people might be con- concerned about, but the reality is I don't know Afghan or Ukrainian refugees personally, but the refugees I know love and appreciate this country more than most of us who were born here because they yes. know what it can be like, right? We may not be perfect, but they know what it can be like. Absolutely. Right? No, absolutely. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, the refugees that I have come in contact with. Now, um, fun fact, um, we, as you said before, I represent and I come alongside the Northeast um, as a director of strategic partnerships. And we've never, that, that starts in New Jersey, all of New York, and then the New England states. But we haven't had um, a, a U.S. office for several years. I mean, actually, it started in Nyack, New York, but it is very expensive um, to help to resettle refugees in in New England. It, it just is. Yeah. Uh, but we did this last July um, before we even knew about what was going on with Afghanistan. Uh, we opened up an office in Rochester 
New York. And, and Rochester um, helps to resettle 1% of all the refugees that come into the United States. And so, uh, so we do now have uh, some representation in New, New England, New York, in Rochester, New York. And uh, we have, you know, since last December, we've resettled several um, Afghan refugees. And now we're getting other refugees from the Congo in different places. So and I did want to mention uh, when we were talking about Ukraine, we're, you, if you go to our Facebook page uh, and look for this uh, conversation, you'll find an update video also from World Relief about you can see firsthand what's going on in Ukraine. And yes. so, so, Patty, a couple minutes left. Um, so I, I think what so if I'm a pastor, church, lay person, what have you, and I'm hearing this and I'm feeling called and convicted, what? do I do? And what does it look like to get involved with World Relief to do this? Because you talked about working through the church and supporting the church. What does that look like? Yeah. So um, the first thing I would say was I would go to our website, um, www.worldrelief.org or wr.org um, and, and begin to educate yourself, you know, begin to, to learn. There's tremendous resources on that website. If you're in New England and got, you're a pastor, like you said, and God is really calling you um, to get your, your church and your congregation and your community engaged, um, we are happy to come alongside you. I'm happy to come alongside you. Um, and so I would say, you know, people can reach out um, to you or they can, they can reach out to me via email at uh, pmacdonald at wr.org. Um, I would say that, you know, it, for many churches, this whole, let, let's just talk about working with refugees and becoming educated on immigration and asylum seekers. Um, we know that this has been um, somewhat of a, you know, a volatile subject. And so I think the best way is to get everybody on the same page like, you know, uh, read uh, one of Matt Soren's books and Jenny Yang's books on welcoming the stranger. If you want um, resources, reach out to me because, you know, I have several um, recordings of town, town halls and Matt Soren speaking on what is a biblical a mandate to come alongside and serve refugees. Um, and so if, if you're interested in those subjects, either reach out to me, start with the website and begin to investigate and, and just continue to ask the Lord you know, how he is leading you and your people. But again, I also put together uh, significant partnerships in, in, ten di in the 10 different countries we work deeply in regarding um, the extreme poor. And uh, we have a tremendous model. I you know, Charles, I've been in relief and development for just a little under 25 years, working for faith-based based organizations, some that you'd be very familiar with. And um, I would just tell you that I believe out of all the various different wonderful organizations out there, World Relief, having the model of keeping the local church um, as the, the hero, basically, and, and working through the local church um, is a model that is really distinguished and um, is really for lasting change. It's sustainable. So if you want to speak to me about that, um, I'd love to share with you about that also. And some of the largest churches in New England, I, I know a church that you were very involved with in Connecticut, um, you know, have partnerships, significant partnerships with World Relief. So I'm, I'm really happy to come alongside you um, in kind of walking you along. What would that look like to have a three-year or more partnership with World Relief in a country that um, not only um, values the local church, but we also work in Sudan and Cambodia, where it's minority church, and yet still have um, a way to uh, come alongside with technical services, meet the needs of vulnerable people, but also be the reflection and um, love of Christ. Yeah, and I think, and if I put my small church where I've had, I've had the big church experience, small church experience, some small churches may sit there saying, well, we can't, this is too big for us to do, but you also, and they work in collaboration with other churches. 
Yeah. And it'll be four or five, six churches working together to host a family. So it doesn't have to be, hey, I'm going to take in 100 families, right? Oh, when you're talking about resettling refugees yeah. and things yeah. like that? Yeah. So, um, yeah, we saw that. Um, I came alongside Park Street Church when they were, um, I was on their council when they decided to help to resettle 40 plus Afghan uh, coming in, but they used uh, other churches and we, yeah, we were able to pull together um, a network. We were pull, we were able to pull together and offer, um, yeah, free uh, services and videos on how to resettle refugees, how to build friendships with, uh, you know, people of different faiths and how to be a welcoming community. So yeah, yeah. So if you're a smaller church, definitely the, there's a place for you with World Relief. Patty, thank you so much for the work you do, but thank you for being here too. And thank you for what World Relief does. Uh, we appreciate your time and, and all of your friendship and support to Vision New England too, and New England. Yeah, well, we're thrilled to be a sponsor of Vision New England. And I'm so happy to be able to work with you and just dialogue with you over the last few years. It's been, it's a joy and a privilege. Same, same here. Thank you very much. I'd also like to thank our producer, Jess Mangano, and our listeners. I hope this dialogue helps you be the people of God who do the work of God, in this case, making disciples to transform our world. Visit us at visionnewengland.org for past episodes and resources and click donate to partner with us to accelerate evangelism in New England. Go to wr.org. And if you can't find Patty, let me know. I'll get you connected. <laughs> This program is brought to you by our friends at the Luis Palau Association who are dedicated to proclaiming the good news, uniting the church and impacting cities worldwide.